Joining us this morning here at the aquarium for our online academy. I'm so excited to have you today because we're going to be talking about a very exciting group of animals called invertebrates. Have you heard that word before? I'm going to give you a minute because maybe you can reflect if you've ever heard that word, if it's your first time hearing that word. But if during this program you do have any questions, any thoughts, like if you know what the word invertebrate means, you want to share with us, we do have a live text line that you can use. And you can see that number on the screen right here. That number is 562-286-1838. So once again, you can use this live text line to talk about anything that you're wondering about. And I do highly encourage for you guys to use it as well, friends, so like that I can talk about the things that you are interested in. And if you are watching this program after it airs live, so after about 1030 in the morning on October 4th, you can still send in your questions and observations. But instead of using this live text line, you're going to want to use our email. And that email is live at lbaop.org. So you're going to use the email if you're watching after we aired live, but you want to use this live text line if you are watching live and have any of those questions. So have you heard, thought about that word a little bit more? Invertebrates. Hmm. You can write it down if you know what it means. You can think it. You can shout it out. If you're watching this with someone, you can tell them. But I want to now share with you guys what that word means if you haven't heard it quite yet. So what an invertebrate is, is they don't have a backbone. Any bones. So are we an invertebrate? Do we have bones? Hmm. Let's do a stretch. Huh. Do you feel this right here if you're stretching with me? This is your backbone. So if we have a backbone, are we an invertebrate? No. We're what we call a vertebrate. So we're going to take out that in. And we're a vertebrate. But animals like jellies, sea anemone, sea stars, and some of the other animals we'll be exploring, they don't have these backbones, so they're an invertebrate. So let's take a minute, let me step off of the camera, and I want you to make some observations. How do these jellies move? Now that you know that they don't have any bones, what do you observe about the way that they're in their exhibit, the way that they move? or any observations in general, even what body shape you see, what colors you see, what do you notice about these jellies? To start off, I wanna talk about their movement because they're definitely very wiggly, right? They're just kind of flowing around. Let's move the jellies. Ooh, you just kind of float around. They don't have any bones and they don't even have brains, friends. Jellies are very special in the fact that they don't have a lot of things. So they just kind of float around as to wherever the ocean takes them um, when they're out in the ocean. So if the water's really rough on a stormy day, jellies will be like, whoo, whoo. but if it's very calm water, they'll just kind of float around. Like if you've ever floated in a pool on the water, that's what jellies do. Here in our exhibit, we have little currents going on that will keep them um, moving all around. So we observed, they're very wiggly. They float around in the water. What do you notice about their bodies? They have a, a lot of different parts, right? So we can see this frilly stuff right on over here. Those are called their oral arms. If you look at that deeper purple part, that kind of looks like dark spaghetti. That's how they're able to sting. Those are their stinging cells. If you're looking at this big part right here that keeps kind of pumping back and forth, that's their bell for them. So they have a lots of body parts too, even though they don't have bones that they'll be using in different ways. Hmm, what's another thing you notice about these jellies? Have you seen a jelly before? Have you ever visited the aquarium before? There's so many different types of jellies out in the ocean. So I'm going to let my friend Alicia today, because I'm not alone in the studio, friends, show us a different jelly we can observe. Ooh, here we have a different jelly. Does it look different from the ones we were looking at before? Yeah, right? But just like the other jellies that we were looking at, they're going to be an invertebrate as well, even though they're slightly different. So you can see this one has spots. You can see it has some of that frilliness, but it's a lot shorter and stouter. And those oral arms right under it, I believe. I'm trying to get a good look at this jelly right now with all of you. But a lot smaller. 
but they're still going to have those very similar body parts. Let's take another jelly just to make sure that they are going to be similar with one another. Ooh, these are our moon jellies. These are my favorite jellies. Don't tell the rest. Um, you can t see right here. What is this part called that I was telling you about? This is the one that we saw pulsating back and forth. So just pumping back and forth their bell. So you can see their bell for them since their body parts are under them and a lot stouter. So a lot shorter. It might be a little bit hard to see. But all around their bell, they have their stinging cells. And then right under that, they have their oral arms. So you might be wondering, well, what do they use those different body parts for, right? So, their stinging cells, what do you think those stinging cells do? They sting, right? So why do you think it's important for an animal like a jelly to be able to sting? Hmm, in what way do you think that can help them? to protect themselves, right? So those stings can help them protect themselves. If they're trying to catch food, they can sting their food in order to eat it. And then I also mentioned another body part. Let me see if I can grab an example of a jelly I have. So we were talking about the frilly part on jellies, right? So this is their oral arms. So what they do with these oral arms is that, and you can see those oral arms right here, that lacy part in the middle. So what they'll do with these oral arms is first their singers sting their food. So for this jelly in this picture, it's going to be these long red spaghetti-like things. So they'll sting their food with those stingers. Then with that frilly part, these oral arms are able to grab onto that food that's on their stingers and take it down to the middle because this middle part on the underside of their bell is going to be where their mouth is. Their mouth is very small, friends, so we won't ever really be able to see a jolly mouth or to see if they're smiling at us or anything like that. But it will go inside of there and then into their tummies where they will then be able to digest their food. If I'm telling you their mouth is very small, though, I have a question for all of you. Do you think their food is really small or do you think their food is super, super big? Really small, right? They eat very small things. They'll eat different little planktons and algaes they can find in the water and... Um, uh, sometimes when we feed them here at the aquarium, what we'll do is we'll blend up a nice little brine shrimp smoothie for them and then be able to feed it to them. Some jellies, I do want to say, friends, will sometimes eat bigger animals. Some jellies will eat different types of jellies as well. So it kind of depends on the type of jelly we're specifically talking about. But a lot of them will be eating those smaller things. It's not going to be a smoothie that we like, but it's definitely a smoothie that they like. And here you can just take a look at one of these other jellies. So once again, these jellies that we are talking about belong to a very wide group known as those invertebrates. Say that word with me one more time. Invertebrates. So they don't have bones. But like I said, there's different animals that belong to this group. So I want to go ahead and say goodbye to our jellies. And we can look at a different animal. We can look at some sea stars. So let me move off of the camera. And you can start to make some observations. So we have some sea stars right here. I also want to point out, friends, a very close relative that we have to jellies that um, lives within this exhibit, too, are the sea anemones. So if you ever look at a sea anemone and it reminds you of a jelly, they are related. But I just wanted to point out that out to you. But now I want to give you a couple of seconds to look at the sea stars. Is it surprising to you that sea stars are an invertebrate? We talked about how invertebrates don't have backbones. They don't have bones. Did you think sea stars had bones? Huh. So what do you think, even when we're looking at the sea stars, what do you think they feel like? How do you think sea stars move? These are some things you can start to think about. Because here in this video, are you noticing a lot of activity coming from the sea stars? No, right? They're kind of just hanging out. Even if you look at these, this sea star right here, it kind of looks like it's just hanging out at the beach a day out in the sun and everything. So they won't always be moving around. Sometimes they'll just find a really good spot on a rock and they're able to stick onto there. Ooh. So here's a little bit of a different angle from the other sea stars we're looking at. We were looking at the top part of those sea stars, but now we're looking at the underside of the sea stars. What do you notice about it? 
What are all these little things right here? Have you seen these before? Those are called tube feet. You can say it with me if you want, tube feet. So they can have hundreds of those depending on the sea star under their arms. And they're able to use it in different ways. This sea star right here is stuck onto a piece of glass that we have here at the aquarium because of its exhibit. So that's how we were able to get this picture of this sea star. Out in the ocean, they'll stick onto different rocks. Hmm, so they're able to stick on the different surfaces, right? And what other way do you think they might use these tube feet? Because we can definitely see the sea star's arms. It has one, two, three, four, five arms. But like I mentioned, it can have hundreds of these little feet. So we know they use it to stick on to things. They also use it to walk around. So all these little tube feet are able to move all around to get them to from one place to another. This is a very cool video because I will show you those tube feet right here in action. You can see some of them are unsticking, some of them are re-sticking. Maybe the sea star is deciding, do I really want to go or do I want to hang out here longer? <laughs> but they are able to move those tube feet. You can even see the ones out here are able to move in different ways. So moving around will be another thing. Um, in order for them to breathe, they'll also be able to pull that water in through these tube feet. So these tube feet are so important to sea stars. So now you know what the underside of a sea star looks like. So once again, just like the jellies, friends, even though these animals don't have bones, they have different things that help them survive. For the jellies, it was like the stingers that we were talking about that can help protect them out in the ocean. For the sea stars, these tube feet are going to help them survive as it helps them navigate and explore. It's also really going to help them with their food, friends. If they have really, really sticky tube feet, that can help them be able to eat different things. Sea stars can eat different things like clams. Um, sometimes they'll eat little fish and things like that. They eat in a very interesting way though. So this morning, if you've had breakfast, I don't know if you do this, but if you were to have breakfast with a sea star, right? Imagine this, you would sit there, the sea star takes its stomach out of its body and it's able to get that food and grab onto it. Did you do that this morning for breakfast with your cereal? Did you spit out your stomach? And did your stomach cover your cereal bowl and then take it back in to be able to eat? No, right? Kind of gross to think about. But sea stars do that. And it's actually very cool, friends. Here we have a chocolate chip sea star. It does not taste like chocolate chips. At least that's what I believe. Um, but what you can see is their stomach right here. So this kind of weird tan brownish thing, that's its tummy. So they'll spit out that stomach, wrap it around a cla clam or a fish, whatever they're eating, and then they're able to take it back in to do their digestion and be able to process that food. Now that you know that, would you ever want to have dinner with a sea star? Hmm, I'll let you think about that because it is a definitely a very interesting way that they eat. But once again, you can see these two feet right here, which help them grab onto things like clams, and they're able to get those clams open and eat what's inside. So that's another way these two feet really help them. So we've been talking a lot about two feet, friends. Now we know a little bit more about how sea stars eat. But there's so many sea stars out in the ocean as well. So, a lot of the sea stars that we've been looking at have had five arms. So, we can once again, you can try counting, make sure, double check me, do all these sea stars in here have five arms? Hmm, it looks like they do as I'm looking at this little video right here. But, friends, I do want to tell you that depending on the sea star, they can have more than five arms. So we're gonna see one of my very special friends, the sunflower star. How many arms does this one have? Huh. I'm gonna give you a minute to count that if you wanna count it. But, oh my gosh, what astounds me about the sunflower star is all of these two feet. I was not exaggerating when I was telling you that some stars can have hundreds of tube feet. Look at all these. You can count the arms, but there's no way we would be able to count all of these tube feet. You would be here forever, <laughs> and you would probably still miss some. But let's see. How many arms does it have? Let's count together. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen arms. Is that more or less than five? More. So you can see some sea stars can have more arms than just five. Sometimes sea stars can just grow an arm for fun. Sometimes there's no reason why they do. But if they were to lose an arm or anything like that, they're also able to grow it back, which is really interesting. That takes a lot of energy and it can take quite a bit of time, but that is something that they are able to do. And then there's just also just stars like the sunflower stars that can have 18 feet. Sometimes they can have around 20 or a little bit more. So it just depends on the different sea star. We have lots of different sea stars here at the aquarium. So we'll definitely see lots of different arms and lots of those different colors um, that we are looking at before as well. Here we have some bat stars. So look at these colors. There's orange, there's pink, there's red, there's purple, there's violet, everything. I want to challenge you to one thing with the sea stars though. And these bat stars is try to find the one that has more than five arms i'll give you a couple of seconds to do that let's see maybe you're counting through all of them one two three four five one two three four five but you've had a couple of seconds now so let me point it out here we have a bat star with six arms so you can see it right there so like i said depending on the star depending what it's going through <laughs> or what it decides to do they can have more or less arms so sea stars just like jellies that we spoke about before are invertebrates and now i want to visit another invertebrate hmm, let's see who we're gonna say hello to today oh who is this it's an octopus huh did you know an octopus doesn't have bones in its body huh if we were to see the octopus move how do you think it would be moving around it's very flexible so let's see you can see the way it's able to move all of its arms what other things do you observe about the octopus you can also see they have these parts right here. So these aren't tube feet. These are suction cups. They do a lot of the same things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We can see the octopus's eyes right here. We can see its head. It's really big noggin that it has. And you can just see more of the way that they're able to move around. So how many arms does an octopus have? We've been talking a lot about arms. Hmm, do you already know? Let's see if we can count them in this picture. Sometimes they all jumble up. <laughs> one, two, three. We have one right here. Four, five, six, seven, eight. They have eight arms. Hmm, what would be a good octopus pose? We only have two arms, but maybe if you move them fast enough, they'll look like you have eight. <laughs> but they have those eight arms that are going to be really important for them to be able to move around, to be able to get their food. They are very, very flexible. And like I said, they also have these suction cups. They have hundreds of these suction cups. And like I mentioned, they are very similar to tube feet. Oh, and here we have this zoom up of suction cups. So you can see how many are all over the octopus's arms. So we already said that they're able to move around with them. They're also able to grab their food with these suction cups. They're able to breathe. They're able to even taste things. So their suction cups, just like tube feet, were really important to sea stars. Suction cups are super, super important to octopus. Hmm. What's another thing that you might know about octopus? Do you, do you have any favorite octopus fun facts? I know one of my favorite things about octopus is that they're also the masters of camouflage. Have you heard that word before? Have you heard the word camouflage? Hmm. Let's say it together camouflage what does that mean you may already know what it means so they're able to change color and they're also able to change texture depending on their surroundings so i want to play some games to see if we can spot the octopus so let's see if miss alicia can put up a fun video for us to see the octopus Ooh. 
It even took me a second to track down where the octopus was. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Good at hiding. On three, two, one, point to it. It's over here. Have you, did you spot the octopus before I pointed it out? It's doing such a good job at hiding, right? So you can see it. it's changed some of its color and even some of its texture. So what is texture? So they're able to change the way that their skin looks and kind of feels too. So if they're somewhere that's really, really smooth, like a flat rock, their bodies can be completely smooth. But if they're on a very bumpy rock, their bodies are able to change and look very bumpy. That is something that can really help octopuses out there. And I want you to start to think about in what ways do you think camouflage can help them? So as you think about that, I want to take a look at this next video. And then we'll answer that question after. So look, here we have our octopus friend. What is it doing? Oh my gosh, where did it go? I don't see the octopus anymore. <laughs> you can see it's right here. But look how it's able to change that texture that we were just talking about. So it was really smooth right now. You can see that smooth, nice red body. But it's going on to this coral right here. So look at what it's doing. It looks like the coral and it looks really bumpy, right? And you can see its color changed too to more of a brown and tan and white color. So they are so good at doing that. But friends, like I asked, why do you think octopus do things like this? Why do you think they camouflage and what do you think that can help them with? So if they're trying to hide away from predators, right? And if they want to make sure that they're safe, they can camouflage with different surroundings like that they're not very easily spotted. If maybe they're trying to sneak up on some food, maybe they've been looking at a fish for a while or a crab and they're like, I want that crab. So it's going to camouflage and it's going to wait for that crab to be like, hmm, there's no octopus there. I can go outside and the octopus can go I've been right here the whole time. So that's how that camouflage can really help um, these animals. And you can see how quickly that occurs as well. And different octopus of all different sizes are able to use that to their benefit. <laughs> I forgot a word for a second. For a time. I'm sorry. But they can use that to their advantage. So that is something very fun that occurs with octopus. So we've had a chance to really get a sense as to how they're able to use camouflage to their advantage. And in those videos too, we really got a better idea as to how flexible they are, right? We saw them squeezing into smaller spaces. We saw them spread out their bodies like the octopus on the coral reef to be able to blend in. And now I want to share a fun video with you, which I th I'm going to give Miss Alicia a second to find, is I want to show you a video on some octopus enrichment we did here at the aquarium. Because octopus are really smart animal friends. So we do have some octopus that live here at the aquarium and we're able to do very fun things with them too. So us being able to do these fun things just ensures that they're able to use their brain because out in the ocean, they are constantly using their brain. They have to think about when am I going to eat? Where am I going to sleep? Do I want to go to this part of the ocean today? Or I don't know. I haven't really spoken to an octopus so they can even think about different things other than those things that they need to do in order to survive. So here at the aquarium, we're able to do different things. And in this video, we'll spot some different things that we've been talking about. We'll get a good look at those arms again, how they're able to move around. We'll get a good look at these, um, the way that they're able to change color and change texture. So this is going to be a very fun video, but also remember the different things that we've been talking about and see if you can spot the different things that we've spoken about. So put your Explorer glasses on. 
Ooh, so here we have our red octopus is getting some enrichment. So a special activity. So in this little box right here, there's going to be some of the octopus's favorite foods. This octopus is called Little Red. So you can see Little Red is like, huh, there's something in here that I like. It can saw it through the waters. It can feel it through all the little holes in the box. So it's going to figure out how to open that box up. <gasps> Little Red did it, and it's going to get that special treat inside. And you can see Little Red is also just going <laughs> in the box. So you can see, once again, how flexible that body is. So we really got a chance, right, to see how those arms that we've been talking about are able to navigate, open things up with those suction cups, that color change and everything. So octopuses are another very fun invertebrate friends. So I want to say goodbye to our octopus once again. And I want to talk about one last invertebrate, which may surprise you. They're crabs. So let's see. Here we have our Japanese spider crab. Huh. Does it surprise you that a Japanese spider crab or crabs in general are an invertebrate? Do you think crabs have bones? Our mind kind of makes us think that, right? Because we know they have a shell and it, they have all these arms. You would think they have bones, but they actually don't. So, just like jellies and the sea stars and the octopus we've been talking about, they are an invertebrate. They are a little bit different, though. We've been talking about how those jellies and octopus are very flexible, right? But crabs are going to be inside of a shell. So they're not going to be as flexible as a jelly. You're not going to see a crab just floating around in the waves, typically. <laughs> so they're going to navigate the ocean in a very different way. So I want to give you a second just so you can make some observations. What do you take note of when you're looking at these crabs and these animals? So we've spoken about the shell. The shell will be really important to them. I know one thing that stands out to me is all of these arms that they have as well. You can see their eyeballs, even their colors. It kind of looks like a rusty red. So, hmm, I have a question for all of you now is why do you think their shell is important for them? If a crab is an invertebrate, why do you think their shell will be important? Hmm, do you think their body inside of the shell is soft or do you think their body inside of the shell is hard? Oh, and here you have another crab that you can kind of think about. Their body inside of their shell will be really soft. So having a nice hard shell will protect that really soft body that they have. So take a look at these different crabs. Because you can see these different shells and this different coloration. But that soft body is protected by the shell that you can see all around here. So every single one of these arms, those claws, if they were to take it out, you would see a soft body and actually crabs do that. They leave their shells. <laughs> so the reason why they do that is, okay, let's say we're baby crabs, right? And we're growing. We've grown a little bit and I'm like, ah, 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 there's no more room in my shell. What am I supposed to do? So they'll actually come out of their shells and then they're able to grow a whole new shell and there's a term i want to introduce to you friends because this is known as molting this process of them coming out of their shells and growing that new shell is known as molting and depending on the crab the lobster it can take either just um a couple of weeks to molt some other ones will take a lot longer They'll take longer times before they molt. So it just also depends on the animal. But that is something that I think is very fascinating about um, crabs and lobsters because their shell is so important to them for them to be able to survive. So them coming out of the shell will make them very vulnerable, right? So if they don't have that shell, what they'll typically do is they'll find different little caves out in the ocean, little different places that they can hide so they don't have to worry about anything. 
But here you can see this crab has a very beautiful shell, so it doesn't really have to worry about those things. There's also not very many animals who are going to be able to chew through this shell that they have. There are some special animals with special teeth, like a zebra shark, that are able to chew on these shells, or different types of sharks. But a lot of them will actually be left alone due to their hard shell. So I always think that's a lot of fun to talk about because when we think about invertebrates, now that we know a little bit more about them, you may have not thought about animals like crabs, but they do belong to that group since they don't have that backbone and they don't have their bones. So I want to say thank you so much, friends, for exploring this with me once again this group of invertebrates let's say it one more time together invertebrates we got a chance to talk about some jellies some sea stars octopus crabs different things and adaptations that they have in order to survive and really be able to thrive out there in the ocean and if you have any last question friends um we do have that email that you can use once again to send in any of those thoughts or questions to which is live at lbaop.org but i invite you to join us on wednesday at 9 and 10 a.m for some future aoa programs this aquarium online academy but thank you so much friends and have a good rest of your day goodbye